It was a wild weekend for Marquette Athletic, and we've got everything you need to know coming up. Don't go away, because we've got an exclusive content you can't get anywhere else. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the first edition of the Golden Eagle Sports Report for the semester. I'm Thomas Heiner. And I'm Dwayne Gage. NCAA President Mark Emmer was on campus Monday, and our own Mike Cianagla was able to sit down with him and discuss the NCAA recruiting violations. Can you talk about the, uh, what precedence the NCAA holds over all forms of recruiting violations and also how you feel on teams self-imposing or discipline? Yeah. So. Uh, first of all, let me describe the way those decisions are made. So when, when people think about the NCAA, they often think about the president, Mark Emmert, and, and think of it a bit like uh, I play a role like Roger Goodell in the mm -hmm. NFL. Nothing's further from the truth. I mean, if you think about my job, you think, need to think more like Secretary General of the United Nations, more like Ban Ki-moon than Roger mm -hmm. Goodell. So all of those decisions, like those penalties that you were referring to, those are all decided upon by a committee called the Committee on Infractions that's made up of members across all of the country. So that committee has commissioners and athletic directors and faculty reps and, and citizen lawyers on it. So it's a bit of a jury of your peers. When, when uh, they have a case come before them, they look at all of our rules that are potentially violated. Uh, we cover recruiting in, in, in a complex set of rules, I believe overly complex set of rules. Uh, and, and those rules govern a variety of ways in which schools can and cannot interact with potential student athletes. The whole idea is to make sure that the process is fair, that there's not underhanded dealing among, among uh, recruits and, and boosters and others, and that uh, student athletes aren't taken advantage of. And so that's evolved over the past 40 years or so to be this very thick, complicated rule book governing recruitment. Uh, we have an investigative team that if there's allegations that something went wrong, they'll go out and they'll conduct investigations. They take all that information, they give it to the Committee on Infractions, this independent body, and then they pass judgment on it. And um, when they're making their decisions, they look at the self-imposed penalties. They say, okay, what did this university do or this college do? Uh, did they recognize that mistakes were made? Did they put in place systems that prevent that from happening in the future? Did they take serious steps? Uh, to mitigate those uh, those wrongs, and if they did, then then they certainly take that into consideration when they're deciding if there's going to be any more penalties. From Fort Myers, Florida, this past weekend, for the Florida Gulf Coast Invitational, they would play a doubleheader on Friday, starting with a ranked opponent, Penn State. Last Friday, the girls' volleyball team traveled to Fort Myers, Florida, to face ranked Penn State. Unfortunately, the Golden Eagles were swept. The first set is 25 to 17, followed by the second with 25 to 12. The third set resulted in a 25 to 18 loss. This Friday, they will return to Fort Myers to face against Florida Gulf Coast. After losing to number three Penn State, the women volleyball team bounced back and defeated Florida Gulf Coast. The MU women swept Florida Gulf Coast with a score of 26 to 24, 25 to 17, and 25 to 16 in the last set. Redshirt freshman Megan Neiman led the Golden Eagles with a match high of 13 kills and three blocks. The Saturday volleyball game in Fort Myers, Florida, proved to be a major improvement from Friday's loss to Penn State. The girls' volleyball team successfully managed to come on top of Central Arkansas. The game's five evenly matched sets ended with Marquette's victory with 3-2. to two. This game will prove useful to their future success in the tournament. The team returned to Wisconsin and faced the Phoenix and Green Bay Tuesday. After sweeping Florida Gulf Coast, the MU women did the same to Green Bay with a score of 25 to 19 in the first set, 25 to 12, 25 and 25 to 21 in the last set. Freshman outside hit of Autumn Bailey led the Golden Eagles with 11 kills. Junior Julie Jezerowski adding 20 digs. Junior right side hitter Lindsey Gosh was named to the Big East honor roll for women's volleyball this week. Gosh had an impressive weekend in Florida, tallying 17 kills. Let's hear what Mike Cianocillo and other analysts have to say about women's volleyball. Guys? Thanks, Thomas. I'm Mike Cianocillo, and with me are our analysts, Peter Fiorentino and Brian Foley. 
Let's get right into it, guys. Uh, this team has faced some daunting tasks already in a pair of number three ranked teams in Penn State and USC. Uh, how will games like these help Coach Bond's team heading into conference play? What you really got to look at is the fact that we were swept by both USC and Penn State, like you said, uh, both number three teams. Hard losses, however, they were both at home. So we do have that undefeated record away, 3-0 and on the road uh, to fall back on. Sometimes it's a little bit easier uh, to lose at home because you don't have to face the opposing crowd that long bus ride or, or flight home. So I would prefer that we would get swept at home by those teams. Um, and uh, I, I really think that um, the fact that we've swept Florida Gulf Coast and Green Bay on the road will add to that uh, conference schedule, kind of the experience in that sense. Brian? Uh, the, the losses are definitely frustrating, but Penn State and USC are two of the top teams in the nation. And playing those teams only helps bring up some experience for the younger players who haven't played as much in past years. And that really helps when you face the be teams that are better in conference like Creighton. Yeah, I think it was a good schedule change because uh, the changing of the new Big East, you lost a lot of good teams from last year and you gained a lot of lesser teams and then throwing in those games definitely helps because it's a m d better team. They're more experienced getting into that. So uh, do you, either of you feel that the team is missing the graduates of Holly Mertens and Danny Carlson who were big for the team last year? Uh, Marquette's definitely struggling adjusting without Holly Mertens and Danny Carlson. But they, they, they both finished one, one and two on the team in kills last year, and they both made first team all Big East. Um, so replacing those players, when you lose two of your best players with, and replace them with less experienced one, it's always a challenge. But it's still early in the season. Help getting uh, younger players some playing time and only improved down the stretch in conference play. And when, they're, when you lose your two best players, you really have to fall back on um, the two players that are kind of the, the, the steady, um, that are going to help right the ship when those two players lead. I'm, I'm talking specifically about Eliz Elizabeth uh, Koberstein. She is 10th in the nation in assists uh, per set. Um, she's playing phenomenally. She already has 313 assists on the year. Um, so they're really looking towards that senior leadership um, as far as the rest of the team goes. Yeah, talking about leadership, uh, coming from last season's team to this year, we had Lindsey Gosh and now Autumn Bailey is striking up. What can you guys say about Autumn Bailey and Lindsey Gosh real quick? I mean, Autumn Bailey, um, freshman, she stands at only 5'10". She, she was the biggest freshman of the week two weeks in a row. Um, just a fantastic presence. She, she set the record since 2007 for most kills in a game, so we really enjoyed having her on the court. All right, thanks, guys. We're going to spike it to Dwayne in Studio 6. Thanks, Mike. When we return, Golden News Sports, Sports Report, we are switching over our focus to pitch for women's soccer. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Mark Emmert, president of the NCAA, and you're watching MUTV Sports. Back here on Golden Eagle Sports Report, the women's soccer team was at home Friday night taking on the Colgate Raiders. We go to Valley Field where you see the team getting ready. And MU goalie Amanda Ingle was ready for action. MU starts off early in the first half trying to get some offense going with Megan Kelly taking a shot, but not enough for the score. Still in the first half now and a corner kick by Morgan. Corner kick and Morgan Profit puts it in to put the MU on top. And as you can see, the MU women celebrate. Now on to the second half. MU trying to put the pressure on by going up by two. And Lynch misses one right outside left. Now Colgate trying to get on the board too, has a corner kick, but it goes way behind the, the, net, the net. MU still up by one, takes another, stop, another shot, but stopped by Colgate goalie. And MU just could not score in the second half. MU holds on with the final score of one to zero. Now let's hear from our own Denny Gallagher, who was at the game. On a night of opportunity, Marquette took full advantage early on at seven minutes in. Morgan Profit got on the end of a Megan Kelly corner that put the Golden Eagles a goal for the good and a goal that would end up deciding the game. I was going to play it short, but then I decided I was going to play it into the mix. And um, Morgs came in out of nowhere and just put the ball in the back of the net, and everybody was so excited because it was her first goal of the year. Freshman Morgan Profit has taken each opportunity in stride with the Golden Eagles and did so again in the seventh minute, getting her name on the score sheet for the first time. Before the corner kick, I told myself that I was going to win it, So, and my person marking me wasn't as tight, so I took advantage of that, and when the ball was coming, I proceeded to head it in. <laughs> 
On the same corner that brought Morgan Profit's first career goal, Megan Kelly moved into the history books, tying the all-time assist record here at Marquette. I think it just goes along the lines of I think what this program has been about all, all along. You know, it's uh, players coming through the program and, and stepping up and contributing and leaving their mark. And you know, I think Megan, based on kind of what she's done all along, um, you know, she took a step forward and put herself in the record books. Um, you know, she I, I, she's not about that. Uh, you know, Megan is not looking for that. She she loves to win. She loves to compete. She loves to be around the players that that are in the program. And, um, you know, she's just really excitable about just playing the game. The Golden Eagles look to get another great result Sunday as they head to Illinois State. Reporting from Valley Field is Denny Gallagher, MUTV Sports. Following the game Friday night, Coach Roeders, Morgan Prophet, and Megan Kelly discuss facing their next opponent on Sunday, Illinois State. We just got to get our legs back and, you know, hopefully rest up as much as we can. You know, Illinois State, um, they have a, played a really tough schedule so far. They've been on the road a lot. You know, they played tonight, they won. And, um, you know, they, they will come after us. They have some uh, special players. Rachel Tejada is, is somebody that's up front who can score in bunches. And, um, again, we, we really have to step, step forward on Sunday and, you know, maybe play an even better game than we did tonight, being on the road. So, but we've been on the road, so we know what that's like. That's nothing new to us now. Illinois State will probably be the same type of team, we think, like scrappy. So we want to come out the, same, the way we did in the second half and keep the ball and play our game and make sure we just go at them and hopefully score more goals. We've got to bring more energy than we did tonight. Um, we have to just prepare our bodies, um, eat well, sleep well. Um, we had a quick travel down there tomorrow. Um, we'll do a little jog there when we get there, just get our bodies going, um, stay fresh, and keep our mind on the game. Sunday afternoon, the Lady Golden Eagles traveled to Normal, Illinois, to face the Redbirds. The Golden Eagles fell behind 3-2. to two. Our analysts have more for you on the split weekends from women's soccer. Mike? Thanks, Thomas. Guys, women's soccer had been rolling heading into Sunday. What do you think happened on the road against Illinois State to the ranked Golden Eagles? It was one of those days. You know, when you look at soccer games, you see uh, top-ranked teams that can lose to the worst teams out there. Um, our girls had a tough game. They put up 14 shots in the second half. Emily Jacobson, one of our defenders, scored twice. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes your shots aren't going to go in. Sometimes the goalie. Uh, Aaron, Aaron uh, Newson was just fantastic. She had uh, th 13 saves and we gave up two goals. So our, our forwards really just weren't making shots on, on that game. Uh, Illinois State, even though they're only 5-4 and four in the year, they're 4-1 and one at home, and it's a tough, tough place to play. Um, so, and that, that only loss came against which is the now, now ranked Wisconsin team. Mm -hmm. So even though it's frustrating losing to a, a ranked team, or an unranked team, the, it, it's something that they can bounce back from. Now, we've seen Taylor Madigan scoring a lot recently. How important is she to this team on both sides of the ball, offense and defense? I mean, if you look at her stats uh, between last year and this year, you see that she uh, has already matched half of her goal total of last year. She scored eight times last year. She already has four through eight games only this year. So you really see her as more of an attacking midfielder, which is not always a bad thing when you look at the, a game like Illinois State where we lost three to two. Um, by one goal, and our defenders were scoring most of the goals. We want m more of our midfielders going towards the goal. Uh, she's a taller girl, so she has that uh, heading advantage. Uh, I know she scored at home. Um, we played St. Mary's, so uh, I really enjoyed seeing her as more of an attacking forward. Although, uh, when we're giving up those three goals, you might want to see her a little bit back on, a little bit back on defense. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, Taylor Madigan, I mean, being a captain, she's going to provide good offense and defense. She scored about three goals in the Marquette Invitational, which was great. And she's usually the vocal leader out on the team. Right. And Amanda Engel, she's been very solid in the net this year for Marquette. She's making a lot of saves, but unfortunately, she's giving up a few goals. Uh, what, what does the team need to do to help her out in the net and get more clean sheets and shutouts? Right. Uh, I, I think they're coming out flat early in games. So the other team's getting early and easy scoring opportunities. Um, they, in the Illinois State loss, uh, the Redbirds scored in the first minute of the game. Uh, they allowed two, the Marquette allowed two more goals uh, before the 30th minute of that game. Uh, they also allowed a, an early goal against Portland and another early goal against uh, UCLA. So they need to really tighten up the, the defense early and 
Oh, really tight, tighten up. Yep. All right. Thanks, guys. That's all we have to offer at the analyst desk. Let's see what Dwayne has cooking for us in the next block. Hello, this is Louis Bennett. I'm the men's soccer coach here at Marquette, and you're wa watching Marquette University TV Sports. Welcome back to Golden Eagle Sports Report. Men's soccer travel to Ann Arbor, Michigan Friday to take on the Wolverines. MU men's soccer team took a 1-0 victory over Michigan, who had been undefeated until they faced the Golden Eagles. Senior Eric Potter scored the game-winning goal in the 90th minute on Friday, which gave them the victory over Michigan, giving MU three straight wins, improving their record 3-1-1. One, one. After their match Friday, the men's squad came back home Sunday to face the Michigan State Spartans. On Sunday, the Michigan State Spartans came to face off the Golden Eagles at Valley Fields. To start the first half, Michigan State opened up the game on the offensive with a series of shots on goal. Marquette goalkeeper Charlie Lyon had a number of close saves while the game continued to progress back and forth with Marquette's offense, occasionally marching down the field with a few major offensive plays. However, Michigan State continued to have the majority possession of the ball, challenging the very best of Marquette's talent on defense. The game went into halftime with Marquette down a goal. It wasn't the first half they were looking for. In the second half, Michigan State's offense continued to bring heat to Marquette's goal by once again pulling off another remarkable goal. Later, Adam Lysak had the Marquette corner and forward Coco Navarro was unable to convert off the cross. Louis Bennett later had one last shot attempt to get Marquette back in the game. The game ended with a bitter loss of 2 to nothing. MUTV Sports owned Peter Bosch was the Valley Sunday for the recap. After taking on the Wolverines Friday in Ann Arbor, the Golden Eagles traveled back to Valley Fields to take on the Michigan State Spartans. It was a tough matchup. There were a lot of fouls, and the Golden Eagles ultimately fell 2-0. to zero. We were disappointed, obviously. We were disappointed with the outcome. I think the first half performance was uh, definitely not up to par. I think you know, Michigan State got a foothold in the game, and uh, it, it made a huge uh, consequence to the final result. The rain was heavily falling in the first half today at Valley Fields, resulting in a lot of shaky fouls by both sides. In the 35th minute, Michigan State took advantage of the poor playing conditions and netted the first goal of the game. Redshirt junior Dennis Holowati gave no excuses for the poor first half play. I mean, the thing about that is both teams got to play on it. Um, I mean, we knew about the conditions. We, we walked the field. We, we you know, we, we brought the right shoes, and, and I mean, we were ready. So both teams had to deal with it. You know, I don't think that really affected us. We had a game plan, and, and, and we tried to execute it. Early on in the second half, Michigan State would add yet another goal to make it 2-0. to zero. The Spartans would hold on to this lead even through an offensive barrage by the Golden Eagles. Marquette outshot Michigan State 16-3 and held a 9-0 advantage on corner kicks in the second period. Although Marquette played tougher in the second half, Coach Bennett was disappointed in the quality of the performance that now ends a 14-game home winning streak. Our goal is to make sure that when people come to Valley Field, um, our performance matches our, our, uh, uh, the quality of our field and the quality that we, we, we have in training. And today I didn't think we quite match the quality that we have in training. And that, that's, the, that's not going to be good enough. You know, it's been a long time since we've lost at, at the Valley Field, but now we have to start a new streak. The Golden Eagles win streak ends at 3 this evening, and they will take on Loyola Chicago this Saturday at home. Reporting from Valley Fields, Peter Bosch, MUTV Sports. After Sunday's contest against the Spartans, Coach Bennett and Eric Pottis talked about the quick turnaround from Friday's match in Ann Arbor. I won't say it's hard. It's a different kind of challenge. You know, I mean, college sports is full of different kind of challenges, and that will never change. I mean, uh, you know, we go all over the country, um, and we have a short turnaround, and we have a longer turnaround, and I think that that won't be the place we look, we start when we look at what we could have done better. The turnaround was what it was. Uh, I mean, and, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the tournament situation, this mini tournament, the Big East Big Ten Challenge obviously was no longer because certain teams have left the conference, etc., etc. Uh, but that's of no consequence. I thought we were pretty well prepared today to get the job done. We just couldn't fire, we didn't fire on all cylinders until it was a little late. 
Yeah, it's always a quick turnaround. Um, I mean, but coaches prepare us very well. I mean, they took care of us. We got to stay an extra night in Michigan, get a good night's rest, and bus back. Had a light regen session yesterday, so uh, there should be no excuses there. But um, you know, it it is a quick turnaround, and you know, long games. But that's what that's what season's all about. You're just battling, and you know, getting your body prepared for the next game. So now we're going to see what the analysts have to say about this. So back to you, Mike. All right, we're here to talk about men's soccer. I'm with Peter Fiorentino for one last time. Pete, uh, let's talk about the most recent weekend for men's soccer, playing both Michigan and Ann Arbor and then Michigan State here at home. What, what can Louis Bennett's squad take away from the win and the loss? When you look at the win against Michigan, you see a very resilient game where uh, the guys played well the entire game. It was a 0-0 tie, and when you see um, – when the score is nil after 89 minutes and mm -hmm. you go into those last two minutes of play, and it just gets real intense. It comes down to who wants that goal the most. And uh, Marquette wanted that game. Uh, we had a long throw in from Jake Taylor over to uh, uh, Axel Hoberg, um, who headed it right to uh, Eric Pottis, who put it in in the 90th minute. Uh, a fantastic win for our, our men's soccer team uh, in Ann Arbor, which is a pretty, um, pretty hefty place to play at. I mean, there's definitely a lot of fans there, a lot of Michigan State alumni who come back for that kind of game. Um, but against Michigan State, what did you see uh, specifically? I mean, being on the field for that game and watching it, it was, it was kind of frustrating to see that the Marquette men's soccer team, they had so many offensive opportunities that it was just frustrating to see them just, it was right in front of the goal and it just, they couldn't convert. They couldn't execute off of right. like golden chances in front of the goal to get out of a shutout offensively and then maybe even tie the game or take the lead. And then on the flip side, Michigan State, too, like it was happening both ways. I don't know if it was because the field was wet. Uh, I don't know if it was because Marquette was coming off that quick game from uh, being in Ann Arbor. And uh, Eric Pottis had mentioned that they were given a day to, or the night to spend in Ann Arbor. So then they came back on or Saturday. And then to come back home Sunday, at the Valley to take on the Spartans, Big when, East, Big when Ten Challenge. the weather challenge. was in inclement. Yeah, I mean, was weather was, weather was inclement, cold. but, I mean, both teams had to play with it. Dennis Holowati mentioned that. I mean, it was, it was kind of a mess to watch. Like, when you saw Michigan State, their first half, it was, yeah, they had offensive opportunities maybe more than Marquette did, but it wasn't that they were outplaying Marquette. It was just that it seemed like they, they were fatigued. Yeah, and then you look at the, and then they, and while well, they wound up scoring mid to late in the first half, then they come out in the second half and they catch Marquette basically without paying attention. Right. And it was just, it was rough. It was rough to watch. Well, I mean, and what I'm noticing especially is that our defenders have four goals and six assists in the last five games. Um, most by Marquette ever. It's really, we, have, we should have our attackers on defense uh, playing more defense, if that makes sense. All right, thanks, Peter. That's all we got. Let's send it to Dwayne and Thomas. That's it. That's all this week, folks.